So Shadow of the Earth Tree has been out for a hot minute, and the reception seems to be more mixed than usual. Maybe it's a combination of recently biased and mainstream popularity, but the player base seems more mixed compared to past DLCs. And I find that a little strange, because if you ask me, the DLC strikes me as Elden Ring 1.5, and by that, I mean it's very much the same as the base game in good and bad ways. But even though it's easy to dismiss many of the common complaints, there's also valid criticism within the salt. FromSoft may have built up a lot of goodwill, but they aren't perfect, and the DLC is a great example of that. But before getting ahead of myself, I should mention that this isn't going to be a FromSoft hit piece. Despite whatever pitfalls they fall into, From has still had a really strong track record, and one DLC update doesn't mean that they're washed, at least not yet. Speaking as a Souls fan, I think we've been eating good for the past few years, and no matter how bad things may seem, it could be a lot worse. Trust me, I know from experience. But contrary to what you see on the internet, it's possible to enjoy something and still be critical of it, and that's my goal with this discussion. I closed the previous Elden Ring video on a positive but apprehensive note, and sadly, Shadow of the Earth Tree didn't exactly quell those fears. So to start with the positives, Shadow of the Earth Tree is more or less Elden Ring final mix. Miyazaki's goal with the DLC was to give players that sense of wonder and discovery they had with the base game, and I'd say he largely delivered on that promise. Whether you loved or hated Elden Ring, I don't see how the DLC would shift the needle one way or the other. However, I will say that exploration in the DLC feels noticeably worse compared to the base game. There's a surprising amount of empty space in the DLC, which is strange compared to how dense the base game feels. And moreover, I personally find that exploration in general feels less rewarding. In the best case scenarios, you find a new pathway, a boss, new items, or shadow fragments, but in most cases, you'll likely just find another goddamn cookbook or something. I'd probably feel differently if I had a less melee focused build, but just like the base game, the exploration in the DLC starts to feel tedious after a while. But you better not think about skipping the exploration, because by god do you get punished hard for not exploring the map. Which leads me to the next point. The bosses. Now, before getting to the nitty gritty, I will say that boss quality in the DLC is roughly on par with the base game. I know that sounds like a milquetoast statement, but I generally think Elden Ring has a solid boss lineup, assuming you ignore repeats and normal enemy bosses. There's some amazing bosses, some okay ones, and straight detritus, and the DLC is no different. For me, the standouts were definitely Mesmer and Midra, with special mention to Rolana as well. These bosses in my opinion had the best balance of difficulty, aggression, and lore relevance, and I had fun learning the ins and outs of their fights. But where it gets dicier with the other major bosses. In my last Elden Ring video, one of my main critiques was the general speed and aggression of enemy encounters, and that mostly applies to the DLC as well. Some bosses just do not stop flailing around, and it can make the fights feel like a chore as a boss goes sicko mode while you sit there waiting for your turn. Obviously this can depend on the player's build, but even as a dex build Marty, I found it was annoying at times, and I say that as someone who prefers the faster fights of Bloodborne and Sekiro. But an issue I didn't mention last time was Elden Ring's emphasis on spectacle. There's many boss fights where the focus is less on an engaging fight, and more on the spectacle and theatricality of the encounter, and you can see examples of this across the game. Bosses like the Elden Beast are the most prime examples, but you can see smaller cases in other fights, like various boss attacks. For example, the Waterfall strikes me as a move that emphasizes spectacle, as is visually stunning, but not very well designed mechanically. And in small doses, spectacle isn't inherently a negative quality, and like most things in life, there's a delicate balance between style and substance. Not every boss fight has to be this nail-biting duel to the death, and giving players a small break here and there is totally fine. But when Spectacle gets in the way of good boss design, it's another story. One example of this can be seen with Bale, who, like many Elden Ring bosses, is a smorgasbord for the senses. He has an amazing design, a killer OST, and attacks that literally tear the earth asunder. But no matter how awesome this fight can seem, I personally find it hard to appreciate. Between the visual effects and good old camera souls, Bale is hard to see and even more annoying to fight, which is ridiculous considering we just had an amazing dragon boss in DS3. Bale stands out to me as a boss that emphasizes spectacle, and it comes at the cost of almost everything else. But sadly, Bale isn't even the best example of this issue, and if you finish the DLC, you already know where the conversation is headed. At first glance, Radon Final Mix shares a lot in common with past Souls bosses. His first phase reminds you of Gale in that he's aggressive, but with enough small openings to eke out some damage. While some delays and mix-ups will mess you up, his first phase is fun and fair, like any great Souls boss. But this changes by the time you get to phase 2. Much like the twin princes in DS3, Mikola piggybacks Radon and adds to his moveset, giving him a few new attacks and adding holy magic to basic combos. And in theory, this is fine. The twin princes were an excellent boss in DS3, and it makes sense to reuse the concept elsewhere. But here's the problem with Radon and Mikola. You can't see shit. Mikola's magic fills the screen with bright light, and on top of that, his stupid luscious hair obscures most of Radon's movements. Radon's basic combos are roughly identical to Phase 1, but you can't rely on visual cues to block or dodge. It feels like you have to rely purely on gut instinct, and while it's not impossible, it's not really fun or satisfying to me. You shouldn't need Mystic Eyes or Flashbang Prevention for one boss fight, and it's frustrating because there's a really great boss fight in there, but it's quite literally hard to see that boss fight. Look, maybe it's the salt talking, but I feel like I'd enjoy this fight way more if it were easier to tell what the hell is going on. 
The Twin Princes and Gale are among my favorite Souls bosses, but Verdon Round 2 just isn't it for me. But there's a way to balance spectacle and substance, and to illustrate this point, I'm going to briefly pivot to another series, Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> now before we click off the video, just let me cook, it'll all make sense. But before getting into it, as a fair warning, I will get into the bosses of the Kingdom Hearts series, but the focus will be on boss design and boss mechanics. While bosses will be shown on screen and discussed, the story of the series won't be addressed at all, so if you're really averse to boss spoilers, feel free to skip ahead to this timestamp. We good? Cool, let's make some noise. So depending on your age or gaming interests, Kingdom Hearts may have a myriad of reputations, like being a button masher, or a lack of difficulty, among other things, most of which is justified to an extent. But the series has always turned up the heat when the time is right. And to give you an example, I'm sure this cutscene is enough to give some fans PTSD. Dance, water, dance! But where it gets interesting is when it comes to super bosses. These boss fights typically push the limits of both the player and the combat system, with the best examples being the super bosses of KH3. What makes these bosses hard are the same traits you see in any challenging boss, like high damage output, varied movesets, and small punish windows. Every boss plays a little differently, and figuring out that rhythm can be a challenge in of itself. Some bosses will try to zone you out, while others give you no time to breathe. Many bosses even have built-in delayed attacks, unblockable attacks, guard breaks, and status effects, and it's up to you to deal with that onslaught. And while every boss's openings and punish windows, actually finding those openings can be tricky. Sometimes a standard block from reprisal can work, while other openings require a bit more out-of-the-box thinking, like air stepping at the right moment, using magic, or a precise counterattack. Unlike the base game, button mashing is a surefire way to get yourself killed, and every super boss requires patience, quick thinking, and even quicker reflexes. But after you start making progress, things start to heat up. During certain points in every fight, each boss will unleash something called a desperation move, or DM for short. In Kingdom Hearts parlance, a DM is typically a boss's ultimate attack, and it's usually done at certain HP thresholds. Now, DMs actually exist in the Souls games to some degree, and they line up much more with the implied definition of the term, like a single attack that happens at low HP. The first example that comes to mind is Consort Radon's Meteor Attack, but you can see similar examples across the series. But the average Souls DM is nothing compared to Kingdom Hearts. Not only are DMs a boss's strongest attack, but it's their flashiest as well, and many DMs have some of the most jaw-dropping visuals you'll see in a boss fight. But these DMs are not just flashy attacks. Unlike the average Souls DM, a standard blocker roll isn't enough, and you'll often have to use every defensive option at your disposal. A few mistakes usually won't kill you, but you only get a few, and it only takes one bad dodge or block to end the fight. Seriously, just take a look at what you're up against. Here we go! And to make matters worse, DMs can vary wildly in terms of difficulty, length, timing, and usage. While the term DM implies a low HP threshold, some bosses will do them much earlier, and depending on the fight, others can use their DM multiple times, with some bosses having scripted DMs at certain thresholds, while others will use a DM again if you can't end the fight fast enough. And as far as DM length goes, some are as short as half a minute, while others are over a minute long, if not longer. That may not sound like a lot of time, but that's a long time to be spent dodging and blocking a flurry of attacks, all of which can end the run if you're not careful. And the real icing on this is that there's no way to avoid DMs. To my knowledge, there's only one DM you can skip consistently, but even that requires a lot of practice. But 90% of the time, you're gonna have to learn to deal with each DM somehow, and if you can't, you'll never win. But despite how overwhelming all of this can feel, DMs typically follow two simple rules. First, they're always telegraphed. Whether a DM is used early, halfway, or near the end, you'll always know when a DM is coming. And secondarily, every DM is learnable, consistent, and more importantly, can be managed with the tools available. For example, Zemnus will use delayed and unblockable attacks in his DM, which is an easy way to punish players mashing block or roll. But not only are his delays visually distinct, but his unblockable attacks all have distinct audio or visual cues. He'll usually say something edgy like this, right before his unblockable cross slash, and the blue lasers signify attacks that must be dodged instead of blocked. And keep in mind, all of this is happening during a circus of lasers, and when Yoko Shimomura is going crazy with the battle music. As hard as it seems at first, it's completely possible to learn each and every DM, and while you don't need to be perfect, you can do enough to at least continue the fight. So when you put everything together, KH3 super bosses feel equal parts familiar and unique. Every fight involves a good balance of offense and defense, not to mention learning each boss's moveset and their DMs. It's a lot easier said than done, even on the lower difficulties, but like any great boss, there's an immense feeling of satisfaction as you get into the rhythm of each fight and learn how to make the most out of every opportunity. And there's no better boss that illustrates this point than the secret boss of KH3. 
Yozora. Among every boss in this video, Cage and Souls alike, Yozora has one of the most expansive movesets so far, with everything from delayed attacks, unblockables, fakeouts, and more. In fact, he even has attacks that can reduce your max HP, steal your weapon, and even steal your healing items, which he'll definitely use later in the fight. And to make matters worse, his DM is one of the longest in the game, and if you're really really unlucky, he even has a chance to open the fight with his DM, which has the added downside of transitioning right into his phase 2 moveset once it's over. And the cherry on top is that he has the most HP out of every boss in KH3, so you're not only in for a tough fight, but you're in for a marathon as well. Yozora brings out the entire kitchen sink and then some, but you know what's the craziest thing about this fight? It's fair. There's not a single BS thing about Yozora, and the people who say otherwise are either lying or haven't gotten good. His moveset may be expansive, but all of his attacks are telegraphed and learnable. If you get hit with the Keyblade Steal, Item Steal, or any of his mix-ups, that's entirely on you. His openings may seem brief and unintuitive, but almost all his attacks have an opening if you're looking for it or willing to get creative. For example, Yozora has an attack where he vanishes and then reappears with an attack you have to block. But if your timing is good, you can actually hit him as he reappears and get a full combo or two off. His Pyramid of Light attack can be interrupted with a form change, his item steals openings during and after the attack, and he even has two punish windows during his DM. Yozora has openings everywhere as long as you look for them, and this creates a beautiful rhythm and flow to the battle, where you're constantly looking for his next move and responding with the appropriate maneuver. Yozora seems impossible at first, and chances are the first dozen or so deaths won't change that feeling. But as you learn the fight and improve as a player, the beauty of the fight starts to open up, and hopefully, you'll find yourself having a blast. Yozora is a masterclass in boss design, and both he and the data battles are shining examples of how far you can push boss design while still being fun and fair for the player. And the reason for this change wasn't just a gush about KH3 super bosses. Hell, I probably could have used examples from a myriad of different series. But I really wanted to show boss design beyond the world of Souls. Contrary to what you see in the industry, there's more action games than just Souls and Souls likes, and I think it's very easy to get pigeonholed into a formula and lose sight of what's truly possible. There's a wide world of boss mechanics and innovation, and if you're willing to look past the established trends, there's no telling what you can design. Despite many complaints about Elden Ring, it's totally okay to get bosses massive health bars, insane damage, jaw-dropping visuals, and ridiculous movesets. If anything, I actively encourage that. But if you're going to design a boss like that, then at the very least, put some effort into polishing the boss fight. I think the mark of a good boss fight is one that feels fair and satisfying, but on the other side of the spectrum, there's also many bosses that make you sigh and roll your eyes. Every Souls game has at least one boss like this, if not several, and there's only so much patience available for any given player. And this brings me to my final talking point, and one that may affect the future of Souls games. Stagnation. Now, before the essays come out, I should express that I don't think there's anything wrong with the Souls formula, nor is the formula going anywhere anytime soon. Every year brings a new crop of Souls games, and that shows there's still a market for Souls and Souls likes. But what I have noticed is a sort of arms race between FromSoft and the player base. Ever since the transition between Demon Souls and Dark Souls, each entry has gotten a little harder in their own ways. Enemies are faster, bosses are beefier, and everything tends to hit like a truck. And overall, this is totally fine. It's natural for a series to evolve along with the players, and this gradual evolution has led to some of the best battles in the industry. But with the release of Elden Ring, I worry that we're now reaching the zenith of that arms race and the limitations of From's design philosophies. There's only so much you can pump up speed and numbers before it starts to border on on fun. And if you make everything strong, fast, and tanky, where do you go from there? Three phase bosses? Gang fights and multiple enemies smashed together? Bosses that read your inputs? Because From has never resorted to any of those tricks, right? But the point I'm trying to make is that we're reaching the point where the Souls formula needs something fresh in order to avoid stagnation, and raw numbers or gimmicks isn't the solution. And it's not like the Souls formula needs a massive overhaul or anything, it's a formula that clearly stands the test of time. But even a few small tweaks and adjustments could go a long way to breathing new life into the genre. For example, a common issue in many Souls games is the sheer amount of stuff. Items, spells, weapons, etc. And while that's all fine and dandy, there's also a lot of useless crap, like garbage spells, weapons with identical movesets, and so on. I don't think fans would object to having a smaller catalog if everything were more useful or unique. It'd make balancing the game a hell of a lot easier too. And to give you another example, I think mechanical variation or innovation would do a lot for the next Souls game. Personally, I've grown to like the idea of adding blocks to the default moveset, much like how Sekiro and Liza P do it. You could even take this a step further by giving weapons unique counters and parries, or adding more defensive skills, which is something the Neo series does exceptionally well. Giving players more options opens up enemy design space and encourages players to explore every mechanic of the game, which can make for a fun experience if executed carefully. You can even see this play out in games like Lies of P, which encourages a combination of blocking, deflecting, and dodging throughout the game. And as a final example, even something as simple as more quality of life changes is such an easy fix to the Souls formula. Like come on, would it be that much to ask for a better camera, or at least one that zooms out for the bigger bosses? We literally just had a decent camera for Sekiro, just hire that guy again for America's sake. But like I said before, I'm not a game designer, so I have no way of telling how From may evolve in the future. 
But to close out this video, I want to revisit where I last left Elden Ring. I ended the previous video with a mostly positive opinion, with the hopes that the DLC would move the needle in the future. But as it turns out, I think my opinion on the game is largely the same. Don't get me wrong, that first playthrough is magical, and it's hard to forget that sense of wonder and discovery as you explore the lands between. You honestly had to be there, as it felt like everyone in the world was going on this vast journey together. But on repeat playthroughs, and during the Shadow of the Erdtree DLC, the game's flaws start to become more apparent, and most of them are a result of Elden Ring being an open world game. Because everything is so scattered and spread out, most repeat playthroughs usually involve making a shopping list of items and equipment, and then riding line wire from point A to point B, and that typically takes up most of my playtime. Sure, when you get your build going and start throwing hands, it's fun like any other Souls game, but it takes a lot of busy work to get to that point. At the end of the day, most open world games just aren't really my cup of tea, and while I like the Souls parts of Elden Ring, the open world aspect ends up being a deal breaker. Does that make Elden Ring a bad game? Hell no! And if it's your favorite FromSoft game, more power to you! It's just not my preferred flavor of Souls. As for the DLC in particular, well, it's more of the same really. Shocking, I know. I like some bosses, dislike others, and I really don't look forward to things like collecting shadow fragments again. I wouldn't say I'm disappointed, as I felt like I got my money's worth, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't expecting a little more. A highlight of past DLCs was how they enhanced and recontextualized the lore of the base game, and while I don't admit to being a lore master, Elden Ring's DLC didn't have the same oomph the others did, at least to me. I was personally pretty let down by the final boss and cutscene, which had the double whammy of a boss we fought before, and a cutscene that didn't reveal any new information. But still, there's some great bosses, good dungeons, and a host of fun new weapons, and it was still a solid experience overall. In some ways, I think past DLCs just set the bar too high, and anything short of perfection seems like a letdown when that's actually not the case. Shadow of the Erdtree wasn't this life-changing experience, but it wasn't straight garbage either, and I think it largely delivered on being a good, albeit flawed, follow-up to the base game. But to end things on a more positive note, I do have hope for future Souls games. Miyazaki has explained that Elden Ring is just the beginning, and in a recent interview, he cites Sekiro as an example of how much further the genre can be pushed. Maybe I'm a little too optimistic, but that strikes me as an indicator that From is not only aware of their issues, but ready and willing to keep evolving as a developer. Personally, I see Sekiro as their strongest title from a mechanical standpoint, and if Sekiro is the game that paves the way forward, we could be in for something truly spectacular. But hey, only time will tell.